Good morning and welcome to Chatterday Live. I'm your host Jason Robinson and it's a wonderful Saturday. It's the 28th of November and we're here and we are live. I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, for those that are watching as we speak, thank you very much. Uh, so today's show we have... Oh, I'm getting pointed at. Can you hear me okay? They, no, is it gone? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Louder, lower? Sorry, I'm looking at my guest. He's saying louder or lower. Uh, any better? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Don't know what's going on here. Bear with me, sorry. Any better? Oh, right, guys, if you can actually hear me on the Facebook Live, please can you just put in the comments that you can hear me? We're having some sort of technical difficulty. Hopefully you can hear us. Uh, so just throw it out there. I don't know what's going on. Oh, dearie me. What a day to start. Deegy. Right. Ooh. That's the purpose, isn't it? Uh, yeah, by the looks of it on... Right. Dave... Right, okay. I don't think Dave can hear me, but we are live on Facebook and I can be heard, so that's okay. So, right, we'll go, <laughs> we'll go from there. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Right, so in today's show, we are going to be joined by the, uh, the one and only The Blind Poet and Harry McParland, uh, two fantastic guests uh, with uh, somewhat of differences, uh, but at the same time, there is a connection that we'll get to later on in the show. So to start off today's show then, so a little bit of a background. So uh, for those that don't know, I'm currently in isolation. Yes, believe it or not. So um, on Monday, I went and had my COVID test uh, and I still haven't had my results back. I've chased them up, uh, but unfortunately, I'm guessing that the NHS is, as you can be expected, under a little bit of strain at the moment. And uh, I have spoken to them this morning. The test is logged. It's just that the results haven't come out. So I'm stuck inside. So anyway, I'm stuck with you guys. So good morning. Uh, but I feel okay. Uh, and I don't think that we can spread it via an internet virus, so we should be okay. It's uh, it's going to be all right. So in regards to today's show, for those that have been catching up on uh, on our comments and obviously Instagram, Twitter, we are on there and YouTube. Uh, I'm playing devil's ad advocate today, if that's right. Uh, and with today's guest, The Blind Poet, it's in the name. Obviously, there is going to be conversation about sight deficiency, uh, but... You know, we're going to put some stigma to rest. We're going to ask the questions, the stupid questions that I hope you guys that are watching today will appreciate because hopefully it will educate you as well as inform you. And, you know, feel free to ask questions as well in the comments. Uh, our guest on the show today has said quite freely, any question, regardless what it is, it's not a stupid question. Feel free to get involved. But that's not the main purpose. We're going to be talking, obviously, about poetry, the connections that it's brought people together with, obviously the community that's expanded outside the local area, and obviously the sense of well being and community that obviously poetry music obviously the connection with the sight loss as well as brought people together um, hopefully it's going to be a very very interesting show and uh, if anything we're all going to come away a little bit more educated and then after that we do have a very very fantastic young talent by mr harry mcparland who's going to be joining us as well up and coming theater actor singer dancer extraordinaire he's going to be talking to us he's very young but he's going to be talking to us about his career his steps that he's taken the steps that he's going to be taking obviously what he hopes for for the future and it's going to be fantastic because as i said before with harry and the blind poet our guests that are on today there is a slight connection but when we get to the end of the first interview we'll explain why or halfway through the inter interview you'll probably understand why there's a connection if anything um so yeah again once again we are here we are in support of mental health awareness especially through covid19 situation it's not nice people are stuck inside but most of all there is an illness out there that you know people do again take as a stigma so we're here to raise awareness that you're not alone feel free to talk to people we are here I'm here. You can miss us the show. I'm happy to talk to you. And I'm pretty sure that any of the guests that we've had on in the past will quite happily let you contact them as well. We like to stay connected. And as you're well aware, we do have 
our Chatterday Live mugs, and they are still for sale. We've got this one that I'm using now, plus the limited edition Help for Heroes one that we've got. But all the money from selling the mugs does go to Help for Heroes. So if you're looking to spend a bit of money uh, over the Christmas period and make something like a donation and make it personal, do get in touch, and obviously we'll send a mug out to you, and all the profits do go to charity. So, I mean, you can't go wrong there. Right then, so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome onto the show my first guest. Uh, his name is Mr. Dave Steele, the blind poet. Good morning, Dave. Hey, good morning, Jay. It's good to be with you. All right. Can you hear me okay now? Can I can you now. You were really distorted. I don't know what was going on at the beginning there, yeah. but all good now. Okay. So, right. So let's start off then. So as I like to, to mention, though, so for those that have been frequent watchers of the show, you will know that most of the guests that I've had on the show, I, believe it or not, I've had mostly a connection with most of my guests because it's all about staying connected. Now, I haven't really gone into a lot about my past and obviously why I'm staying connected, but I've traveled all over the UK. I've done my part and we'll get into that probably through the show about how we know each other as well. Um, but yeah, so, but this show, like you say, staying about connected. It's, it's nice to again, once again, see your face and have a chat. It's been a while and hopefully we're going to have a really interesting conversation and a catch up. And if not an eye opener for me, excuse the pun. Uh, and hopefully we'll, uh, you know, we'll, uh, like you say, put some stigma to bed as well. So, obviously, I know you as Dave Steele, entertainer extraordinaire, but that's not what you are anymore. Well, you are still an entertainer no. extraordinaire no. in my eyes. But, obviously, it's the Blind Poet. So, if you'd like to, if you don't mind, to our audience, give a brief description about what the Blind Poet is and how it came about, and uh, we'll move from there, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um, I'm from Manchester, obviously, here in the UK. Um, I say UK because... We'll get to it in a bit. I'm kind of used to speaking to kind of people outside of the country uh, now as we'll kind of get to. But um, so I have a, a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. OK, retinitis pigmentosa or RP for short. Now, what it is, is it's a hereditary uh, condition. So, it, you know, genetic runs in the family and um, there's no treatment or cure for this. And the way RP or retinitis pigmentosa kind of uh presents itself the way it affects the eyes is it starts off with night blindness so struggling from kind of light to dark places so for example when a normal sighted person walks in from a, a brightly lit room in or brightly lit outside into like a dimly lit room say for example walking into a cinema it normally takes a couple of seconds for your eyes to kind of adjust to different kind of extremes of light whereas someone with night blindness um, the, the eyes just won't adjust. So what may seem, um, you know, just slight a slight change in light can affect in lots of different ways. So I get really affected by uh, bright light. So, you know, I, I get affected by glare of sunshine. I get affected by um, if it's if it's dull, it will seem like pitch black to me uh, and my eyes just don't adjust to these kind of scenarios. So it starts off with night blindness and then you start to lose your peripheral vision. So like a tunnel closing inwards, you, your peripheral tends to go, as you call it, a tunnel vision. You might have heard that expression before. Mm -hmm. And then you start to lose your central vision next. Um, and then, you know, uh, quite often it results in, you know, complete blindness. Um, where I'm at at the moment is my left eye is completely blurred now. Um, I've only got light perception in my left eye. So if you were to wave your hand in front of my left eye, and my, my pen was over my right eye, I wouldn't be able to recognize any hand movements. I just kind of see shadows. And my left eye, sorry, my right eye is, is my good eye. Um, I've got a little bit central left in that. I've lost all my peripheral. And it's pretty much like looking through a straw. So I can still see um, faces. Uh, thank God, you know, I can see my wife and my children's faces. If they're sat next to me, I'd only be able to see maybe like a part of their face. So if you were sat like right by the side of me at the moment, I'd maybe be able to see like your eye, and then everything would be kind of clouded or just not there. Um, so, yeah, I can still use my phone. I can still see, you know, you to a certain degree. Um, I still have to use a, a mobility aid to get around safely. So I have a long cane that I use. Um, I have a guide dog called Christopher, who's not in the room at the moment. He's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so that, that's RP. That's how it generally works. Now, there's lots of different types of RP. Um, there's lots of different ways that it affects the eyes. That's generally the way it affects, but the stages can, can change and also the genetics can change as well. So there's like loads of different mutations, but the, the, the particular type that I've got in my family is what they call um, a bit of a 
complicated long name. It's called autosomal dominant. So that basically means there's a clear trace in my family. It comes from my mum's side. My mum's blind with it. I've got a couple of sisters that have it. And the genetic side is every time a child is born, um, there's a one in two chance that um, they're going to develop RP when they're older. Right, now, okay. this all started for me six years ago. I didn't really know all this. I first heard of RP uh, when I was about seven years old. My sister um, was the first one to be diagnosed officially with it in my family in the early 80s. She went to a, hospi a hospital in London, which is now one of the world's kind of leading hospitals for eye diseases and things like that called Moorfields. And in the early 80s, they didn't know a lot about the condition. She went in, they, they, they diagnosed her and they said, we think you've got this thing called retinitis pigmentosa. Um, there's no treatment or cure. Oh, and by the way, don't have kids because your kids might have it and you're going to go blind. And that's pretty much all she was told. Pretty harsh. But when you kind of get a you know, diagnosis, whether it be an eye condition or anything kind of clinical cancer, anything like that, it tends to be done in quite a cold clinical way. You know, the, the physicians aren't really trained in, in dealing with emotions and they have to, you know, deal with so many people that they, they, they tend to kind of emotionally cut themselves off a little bit from it. So, um, you know, that was my sister who was first to be diagnosed with RP in the early 80s. I remember at the age of seven going to an eye hospital to get checked and having these drops put in my eyes which i now know to be called dilating drops which kind of open up the eyes so the doctors can kind of look behind them and um, be feeling quite scared about it you know being quite blurry and not being able to see with these eye drops at the age of seven but then after that um it wasn't really spoken about i was always told that it wouldn't affect me until i was really old and just to get on with my life and that was it and i did um you know i when i left college when i was 18 went to work uh, as a blue coat with pontins at the Holy Parks, which we'll get to in a bit. Started as a singer in entertainment, worked as a singer for many, many years, touring all over the place, and and then eventually settled in Scotland. Um, had a had a daughter in my in my early thirties called Ellie, who's now thirteen, and um, me and her mum split up. Bad end to the relationship, um, and I kind of walked away with nothing. Moved back to Manchester, started a new cycle in my life. This was in late 2011. And in 2012, I met Amy, who's now my wife. Um, she had two children from a previous marriage at a similar age to, to my daughter, Ellie. We, it turned out we went to the same primary school together, all but a few <laughs> years apart. She's six years younger than me. We had a lot of um, friends in common, although we didn't knew it. We hit it off straight away. And it was great. You know, I, my life started to rebuild. Um, Austin, she fell pregnant very, fairly quickly. My, our son, Austin, was born in June 2013. And, you know, every, everything was going well. Christmas 2013, I proposed and asked Amy to marry me. We set a date for 2014 for New Year's Eve. See, so, yeah, I, I proposed on Christmas Day and yeah. I, I set the date to get married on New Year's Day so I would never forget an anniversary. Or, or uh -huh. from an outsider's point of view, you've just skimped on buying Christmas and New Year's gifts. <laughs> no, we still have to do that. But <laughs> so you didn't turn <laughs> around big... and go, oh, my God, Christmas is coming. I don't know. Have yeah. I got to buy her slippers? No, it... I mean, what, where are we in this relationship? Hang really... on a minute. I'll just propose. It was a nice night. New Year's Eve's a great night to get married. It was just like, you know, black tie and all that. Anyway, so we set the date for New Year's Eve. Everything was good. We started off 2014, saving for the marriage. I was working in car sales. I was still gigging. Um, you know, things were going well. And um, and then um, I went for a routine eye test in, in April that year, beginning of April. And um, they looked into the back of my eyes and they they said, well, you know, there's been a real change in, in your eyes. The, the pigment is really bad at the back. Your retinas are, are quite deteriorated since the last time we saw you. You need to stop driving straight away. Uh, I remember walking out of the appointment, knowing that everything had changed. And Amy was in the waiting room with Austin in a car seat, um, you know, still a baby, six months old. Um, and I had to break the news to her that, you know, they told me to stop driving and they'd refer me to a retinal specialist. I told my employer um, who they had to let me go. Um, they kind of shuffled me out the door because I could no longer do test drives uh, as I couldn't drive anymore and work in car sales. So they kind of pushed me out. Um, and 
uh, I couldn't do my gigs anymore. I couldn't drive up to Scotland, which I was doing every month to pick my daughter up three and a half hours each way from Glasgow yeah. and bring her down to Manchester. Um, and a week later, I was diag- you know, went to see a retinal specialist and was um, certified as uh, legally blind or severely sight impaired, as it is, which is the highest, you know, sort of classification for sight loss. And that's where it all kind of really started. You know, I, I tumbled into a, a kind of real bad eight months of really dark times and struggling. Um, I'm quite an optimistic person, as you know, Jay, from kind of knowing me for all these years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm one of these people that always believes that, you know, that the best is going to happen. Often that lets me down and, you know, <laughs> I can end up being disappointed. But I always <laughs> hope for the best. You know, I don't do the lottery because every time I buy a lottery ticket, I think I'm going to win. <laughs> you know, but I just, you know, so I'm always thinking that something good's going to happen. That's the type of person that I am. Amy's more of a kind of, she always says, a realist. You know, she likes to see things that you yep. know, they can go wrong and we balance each other out. Um, but yeah, so I remember saying to her, look, you know, don't panic. I know it's bad and, you know, what, what's happened is going to be a lot of change for us, but surely I'm not the first person to go through this. There's got to be a support network out there. All we've got to do is connect with it and find it. And you'd think that, but um, like many, many people, you know, with that diagnosis of, of uh, low vision, I fell through the net. We, every corner we turned to, we were just getting let down by the system. The main benefit support for people with disabilities is something called personal independence payment from the government. And when we applied for that, which was the main kind of benefit support, which supplies you with a motability car and, and you know, gives you the, the, the benefit, you know, um, to support you through not being employed through your, your condition and, and, and everything else and opens up the gateways for a lot of other things. There was an eight month waiting list for that. Right. So from the, the moment of starting um you know you, you you're applying for your benefit it would take you eight months to get your first payment and it was backdated but for someone that you know has got no employment and is really struggling um it, it wasn't any help so we fell behind with our rent um we tried to get the help we need we had to feed our kids on food parcels for a while um I, all the while i was losing my peripheral vision really really rapidly i took a massive dip I was, I didn't go out the house for about eight months without Amy um, because I was really anxious of, you know, the way I was seeing because it was literally like seeing through a straw and, you know, it's this thing of, and I, I, we, we spoke about this before we did the, this, this today, but this is one thing I really wanted to say and get on the call. When you've got no sight whatsoever, you've got no other choice than to adjust. OK, yeah. because you've got no sight. So you have to rely on your other senses to get around when you are losing your sight over a period of time. And you've got vision like I have and lots of other people, the majority of other people, you are you have no choice but to rely on your eyes because they're still kind of working because you, I'm seeing. So, you know, I, I can't just switch them off and then think about other things. I'm, I'm, I'm using something that is actually broken. So, you know, when I've got this tunnel of vision and you're kind of walking down the street and you're trying to use it, and this is before I started using a cane or anything else when I'm, you know, trying to get my training and everything else in place, people are kind of walking across you as they do, you know, appearing, and they just kind of appear, you know, in your in the little tunnel of vision that you've got from nowhere, and it startles you, and you become very anxious. And I was literally, you know, I wouldn't go out on my own. When I was going out, I was holding on to Amy or holding on to the pram. And just being really, really anxious and becoming really withdrawn from society. And the more anxious I was becoming, the more depressed I was becoming. I was um, guilty for all the financial pressure I was putting on my family as well. Um, we were having to move house into social housing for the first time uh, in a long time because um, because of my sight loss and because of the financial position. Um, I felt guilty for that. I was panicked about what area we were going to move to. I grew up in quite a rough area and I didn't want my children to have to sort of deal with a lot of the things that I went through as a kid. Um, and I felt guilty for that. Um, so this was all having an effect on me. And it, this went on for about eight months. And then I had this moment where it all kind of changed. What happened was my sister, who was the first one to be diagnosed, uh, said to me, get onto Facebook, go onto some of these support groups for, for conditions like RP and other low vision because speaking to people who are going through the same thing is the best way of trying to deal with it. So I did that, got involved, started talking to a few people, and then I got asked to go and attend a support group 
uh, physical support group when you could go and actually meet people back in those good old days where we could be together and all that. You remember those? And um, it was in Newcastle. And it was for people with my condition, RP, and another condition called Usher syndrome. Now, Usher syndrome is the same sight loss as, as RP, so the same, exact same sight loss, peripheral loss, and then central, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but also with hearing loss as well, so people who are deaf blind. So they're not completely deaf, and they're not completely blind, okay? Uh, and um, so they said, yeah, you know, come to this support group, and I felt really nervous about being around other blind people of other visually impaired people for the first time uh really anxious about it um being around someone using a cane or someone with a guide dog was like a glimpse into my future um and that was really scary to me so they heard that i used to be a singer so they said oh you know would you mind being our entertainment for the support group would you, would you come and sing some songs for us and i was like uh yeah absolutely because that was my comfort zone so there was my that was my the thing that I could go there and feel like I had a place not feel so nervous about. So I agreed to it straight away. And then the night before the event or, or the support group meeting going to Newcastle, I was in bed. My wife or fiance, as she was at the time, then was trying to get to sleep. Um, and because this was like November 2014, so just before we were about to get married. And um, she was trying to get to sleep. I was going over ideas of songs to sing uh, for, for the following day. And I just had this eureka moment. I, I thought, what a great idea it would be to have a song that everyone knew, but to change the words so it would have more of an emotional response. So I chose the song Stand By Me by Benny King, because that was one of the songs that I used to sing when yeah, I was yeah. a singer. Um, and... Uh, I lo love the opening line of when the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see because that was like night blindness. That described night blindness to me. So within 20 minutes, I rewrote the song. I changed the chorus up, rewrote two new verses and did it all about how I was feeling about my going blind. Um, and I went and sang it that following day and the response that I had was just incredible. Now, I always say to people that when... I had that diagnosis right at the beginning, that April, that I went through in that first eight months or whatever it was. Um, all the things that people tend to go through with a new diagnosis of disability or low vision or blindness or whatever. I lost my confidence. I lost my independence. I had to battle for that back. Uh, my pride to a certain degree. Uh, but the biggest thing it kind of took for me was my purpose. I didn't know what I was going to do next. I, was apply I applied for jobs initially that I was more than qualified to do. But as soon as I mentioned that I was losing my sight and I was registered blind, people were just making excuses and putting the phone down on me. They weren't interested in employing a blind guy. Um, and there's something like 76% um, of people with a visual impairment are actually unemployed because of these reasons. But we'll kind of get to that. So, you know, when I sang that song and people gave me the response that they did, I felt like I got my purpose back. I felt like I had a reason because people were coming up to me and saying that the words I sang were describing how they'd always felt about low vision, uh, about their journey with blindness. And it was making them feel like they were less alone. So then I posted the video, I made a video of it, put it on YouTube, Stand By Me RP, called the song. Uh, I started getting messages from all over the world. I posted it on the support groups same sort of messages people saying that they were using my words as a way for them to describe how they were feeling to their friends and their family so that was mm -hmm. helping them communicate when they couldn't find the words themselves so something inside me clicks because music and poetry to me are the same thing it's song lyrics you know it's not that arty farty poetry that we all think of that doesn't rhyme and you can't understand it poetry is, a, is for the masses and it's for the people and it's really made a comeback over the, the last few years to be in that through diff different um, forms um, yep. and different poets that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but poetry to me has always been music. We've all had a song that's maybe gotten us through a rough time in our lives or a heartbreak, you know, breakup or anything like that in our past. Um, and, and that's what music has the power to do. And poetry is the same thing. So when this clicked in me, all of a sudden, these words just started spilling out of me. I was writing down what we were going through, good and bad days, every single day bearing absolutely everything 
on, uh, and getting my phone out, writing it down and just posting it on all these support groups. And then it was just uh, more messages were coming from all over the world saying the exact same thing about my poetry as they were saying about Stand By Me RP. It was describing exactly how they felt. They were using my words and it was helping people. And that just encouraged me and that started to help me. So I was writing every day, two or three a day. About a year later, I'd written over 100. I'd started a Facebook page named after that song called Stand By Me RP. That's now become one of the largest RP support groups in the world. Um, people then were saying to me, oh, you need to put these poems in a book. And I was like, oh, I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, so they said, well, we'll we're going to start a GoFundMe campaign for you. And they started a GoFundMe campaign and they raised enough money for me to self-publish my first book. And I called it, I've got it here. I called it Stand By, uh, it. there it is. I called it Stand By Me RP. Um, and I released it in February because February is RP Awareness Month, yep. an awareness month for everything these days. Um, <laughs> and that came out in February, tw um, February 2016. And it became in its first week, um, the number one release on Amazon uh, number one European poetry release on Amazon um, in both Australia and America. Crikey. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And it just went crazy, especially in America, more so in America uh, than it did over here. But I think that's because in America, people are more in comfortable about talking about the feelings. In the UK, we tend to be a bit more reserved, a bit more stiff upper lip, as they say. Um, so that came out in February 2016, uh, and it just kind of went from there. I started speaking at events um, for different charities and organisations, telling my story, reading my poetry. Um, I released Stand By Me RP Volume 2 in February 2017. That became the number one European poetry release on Amazon uh, in America and Australia in its first day. And then Volume 3 came out in February 2018, and that did the same thing. And you and can now, get all 19 different volumes. <laughs> yeah, no, just, just the three. I have to stop at three. But, but I'm doing more books. But um, yeah, and, and you know, and uh, now I've become to be known as the blind poet. And the poetry is a means to an end for me. I, I don't consider myself a poet still. Um, people tend to use my poetry as a way of support. Um, that's what it's about. You know, I, I spoke about music having that ability to kind of comfort us in times that we really need it and poetry is the same thing and, and, it, and it does and every day i try and help people who were in similar positions to me those dark places right at the beginning or having a bad eye day and and help them and also change a lot of these misconceptions that we're going to talk about today about yes. you know people think you're either completely blind or you're not at all they think yeah, if yeah. you've got a, a cane you can't use a mobile phone or be on facebook or anything like that and you know and it's not true um and unfortunately there's consequences to that but, you know, that's kind of what I do now. Uh, before we kind of get into the conversation bit, I want to share one piece of poetry. Um, I'll, I'll share a couple a with you. With that. I, don't I want to share one that kind of gives you an idea of, of what we talk about. Now, this, before we do it's, that, if yeah, you don't mind, uh, like you say, there, I know that obviously with your uh, visibility the issues, you can't really see the comments coming up. There is comments coming in. So okay. uh, obviously, good friend of yours, Clark, who hey, we had Clark. on the old, yeah, Clark's on there to say a big shout out to Dave Steele. You know, Clark. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we'll talk about uh, obviously the people that you connect with later on as well. There's, yeah. uh, there's somebody on here called uh, I think it's Michael. Uh, I think that's right. right. I'm really bad with Michael and Michelle's, but it's Michael. Uh, Someone's just saying that they uh, started losing their color in my left eye this year. So obviously, something's uh, so, uh, and they're saying you know this is their life to the T. You know what you're explaining that obviously it's now rapidly just you know there's a spiral effect going on and it's. Uh, you know, as you've said now, it's all about picking yourself back up, if anything, uh, yeah. you know, and finding your, uh, you know, your niche back in the world because, you know, everybody has a purpose. Absolutely. Uh, I've learned a lot. It's definitely a poetry. It is a purpose. But yes, if you don't mind, Dave, please, please enlighten us with some of your poetry. and hopefully Yeah. So this poem um, is, is one from, I think it's in the first book it is. Um, and, you know, I talk about all those dark times at the beginning, but the where I'm at now, uh, and I say this to anyone that is newly diagnosed or, or, or struggling is that, you know, like everything in life, nothing lasts forever. Yep. Um, you know, dark, dark times always end and it's a circle. You know, we, we one step forward, two steps back. We, we you constantly, you know, life's challenging in different things. But I would say that, um, you know, I've learned um, 
I, I, a phrase you'll always hear me say, and I mentioned it in a lot of the poetry, is I've learned to breathe while I still grieve. And what that basically means is um, I've, um, I'm still grieving for the sight I've lost and the sight that I'm yet to lose. Um, but the things that I get anxious about uh, still, I still get anxious about all the same kind of things. So in busy, crowded places, I still get nervous and I tense up, but I don't let it stop me anymore. So I've learned to breathe while I still grieve. So I know that these things that I'm feeling are perfectly natural. Like anyone who struggles with anxiety or depression, um, sometimes the most frustrating things and that we're where we where we struggle the most is when we take it out on ourselves. We're hard on ourselves, mm -hmm. too hard on ourselves, and we stop ourselves from doing things. And once you realize that actually what you're going through is completely normal, completely natural, you can kind of go, okay, right, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to allow myself to feel this. And then once it passes, because it eventually will, I'm going to not let it stop me and I'm going to push on. And that's what it's about. It's okay to pity. It's okay to, you know, feel sorry for yourself and have a bad day. Um, and, and and it's natural to do that. Just don't stay there forever. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm in a position now where I'm grateful for the things that I've learned through my low vision and my blindness. And this poem just says that, and it's called The Stranger. Um, so I hope you guys can kind of relate to that. It goes like this. Today, a stranger asked me, what has blindness done to me? Has it limited the plans I've made or the things I hope would be? Has it forced me now to settle on a life that's second best? Has it made me give up lots of things since I failed the blindness test? Do I still have aspirations, special places, dream to go? Is there any point in beauty if the eyes don't work to show? But my answer came so quickly, not a thought considered twice. I am happy for this blindness, for the way it's changed my life. It has taught me what's important and shown me who my real friends are. And I wouldn't change the things I've learned just to get back in my car. I have met amazing people since this RP took my sight. We share in common struggles, joined together through this plight. Though my retinas are dying, my mind's vision has increased. For each day I'm making memories, for long after sight has ceased. So never offer pity for the broken sense I've lost. For I feel I have gained more than the price that blindness cost. There we go. Thank you very much. Right, guys, if you are watching, I know I can see a few of you are watching. Uh, do us a favor, not for me, not for the show, but, you know, stick a thumbs up and a love heart or something because these poetry is, uh, I love it. I wish I could put a thumbs up, but I'm hosting. So, um, but yay, thumbs up. So, um, obviously, we're going to get into uh, the the poetry and we're going to keep, well, I'm going to get you to read a few more if that's okay at some Absolutely. point. Um, but definitely, I mean, obviously, you've gone through half my questions. You've made my day really easy now, Dave. Well, you can double back <laughs> to re-emphasize points, so absolutely. Yeah, anything, yeah. So, I mean, as I said before, so, you know, so we'll start off. So, I've actually known you for almost now um, over a decade. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been in each other's paths on Instagram and stuff like that. We've been followers and stuff, you know. But as, you know, as life goes on, it doesn't necessarily mean that we see each other every weekend and go for a pint. We just know each other exists and that's how friendship is. It's it's not about Isn't the ones that we see on a daily basis. The best relationships are, though. It's not that kind of neediness. It's like, you know, you can see each other, you know, once in a blue moon for years. And yeah. it's those people who in your life who are always there in the background. But then when you meet up, it's it's like, you know, you've never been away from each other. Yeah, so, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think so, as as Dave said, he was an entertainer. He used to be a performing cabaret, if you will. He'd go around holiday parks, uh, private venues, and obviously entertaining the masses. Um, so if you've ever been to a holiday park in Great Britain, then you're probably aware of what a cabaret act is. It's somebody that turns up and literally just offers you their heart and soul in entertainment. And as me and Dave well aware know, it's probably just the two people sitting at the front that are cheering and the rest couldn't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we, you know, I've met Dave and he obviously came to the holiday parks that I've worked at in the past. Uh, and I've always found you before obviously being humbled by obviously your, your condition. Um, uh, you've always been a down to earth and like probably one of the most friendliest people I've ever met. You know, you're always happy to I talk. So. You know, you, you come to a holiday park, you see us like uh, this our uh, lousy entertainers who are like beneath you, obviously uh -oh. <laughs> in skill level, but you would sit oh. there, you'd have a drink with us, you'd talk with us, you'd chat with us. And even obviously uh, as myself, you'd even entertain us with, you know, letting us join in as well. So uh, going from that, Obviously, that line of work, which, you know, 
I I can very much you know sympathise with that 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 is an adrenaline rush in itself. Obviously, some people have different careers that they get adrenaline rushes in, and obviously, what they really really love doing. But uh, you know, it's you've gone from that. And then obviously you've come, obviously been diagnosed with RP uh, and obviously having to deal with that. And what we're going to do is we're going to like go from the down and then to the up because, you know, you've mixed two together. What you've done is you've taken obviously your past, your entertainment, your showmanship, your confidence. And as you've rightly said, you've gone to one of these meetings and obviously it's a new scary thing to go into and you've taken it you know by both hands and you've gone and you've entertained and you've you've written this uh you know the the lyrics to a very well known popular song uh i mean i on a daily basis make up words to very popular songs but that's not because i'm trying to write them it's just probably because i've had a few jack daniels and yeah. know the actual words uh but um, if it's all right with you i've got a little clip of yeah. you actually performing this uh yeah. as you well know this is a very low budget show i don't have the technology of a massive production crew behind me so i've literally can, gathered this off see this clip before you play it can i just explain yes. where this was so yeah, this was do. i i was we'll get to it in a bit i was lucky enough to do um a tour in america last year i went to uh, the east coast of america and and spoke at lots of events and i actually this video is uh, i was put, um i was doing an event speaking at the um washington dc public library and there was two guys in the room. One of them was visually impaired and the other one's not. There wasn't just two guys in the room. There was lots more people. But there was these two guys within the audience uh, while I was speaking. And it turns out they were musicians. And after I'd gone through the whole story of what I've just told you guys about Stand By Me RP, they said, oh, you know, we've got our we've got a guitar here and we've got um, the, the visually impaired guy had a saxophone. Uh, and he said, let's, um, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's jam it. And uh, they pulled it out and um, we just started performing. And afterwards, uh, someone came up to me, a lady came up to me in the foyer of uh, the, the, the library and said, oh, what's the name of your band? And I was like, uh, no, we just met. <laughs> um, so, you know, these things kind of happen. But this was in D.C. and, you know, I was very honored. So this was in America. And as you've, as you've just said, so the, the actual um, brass player is visually impaired. Yeah. Yeah, and, so the guy the guitar isn't. Of, uh -huh. uh, and the guy on the guitar isn't, but obviously this is a completely this is well, this is what I would like to call one of those like fantastic magic moments that from out of nowhere something has been created, you know, just by uh, you know the, the the fact of being able to be uh, to meet each other in a random situation. We've uh, had lots yeah, so of that so uh, yeah, I'm gonna throw this up here. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear it. Is the idea? Uh, uh, up, Dave. Can you hear that? No, it's I won't be your friend. Yeah, it's just going to be your friend. Just a thought. Now, as you stand, step by me. Was that a no, Dave? You can't hear yeah, that. Unfortunately, it's, it's distorting for some reason. I don't know technically oh, why. Oh, it's distorting, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what I'll do then, I think that's, again, low budget. I need to sack my production <laughs> Don't budget. worry about it. Uh, but what I will do is... Bear with me two seconds. I will. Now you're just starting. I'm here. Is that better? There you go. You're back now. Okay. So, <laughs> like you say, I will. What I'll do is I will get that and I will copy the link to that and put it in the comments and people can watch that back later. I do apologize. Absolutely. So I was trying to get that and make it look all magical and we were going to enjoy it together. But, um, yeah, so, again, you've... So you've gone, you've entertained, obviously you've now gone with your with your poetry, your books and stuff like that. You've now got a support network that obviously expands across the ocean. And obviously I have been lucky enough, thank you very much, to be invited to join in with your Zoom calls where it is nothing but 100% inspirational and uplifting that everybody is just grateful to have this connection that you know that you're not alone and as you've said quite clearly is that you know there wasn't really a uh, a support group it kind of fell through the net this support group and now you and obviously a few others have now merged and uh, you've created something beautiful and wonderful uh and like you say just listening in for the two times that i've listened in is uh it's made me as obviously somebody that doesn't have any visual uh, uh vision impairness or anything like that just take for you know i take for granted on a daily basis what i have and you know i've gone away from it and said you know i don't realize how lucky it is to be able to have such a, a lovely uh, support group you know available for you know in the world 
Go on. I think it's right. quite natural to do that, though. You know, I, we, we all take things for granted in our lives, and you know, mm. that's that's just human nature. But you, you often find in life when someone has had a dramatic change. Uh, you know something that happened to them so you know a diagnosis of cancer or you know some some really severe illness or or you know a loss or something like that it often makes people see the world in a different way and that's certainly what it yeah. did to me you know i um excuse the pun use my tunnel of vision to focus on what's important in life you know um i appreciate the beauty in each day um and in and, and in the people around me a lot more than i did before and you talk about the singing you know i'm a great believer now that everything kind of happens for a reason and it certainly has the, with me you know the way i've kind of experienced it i for many years even through my entertainment days when i was working in sales and things like that i almost felt sometimes that i was cursed because nothing seemed to work out right for me i, I had a lot of stuff go wrong I'll get into it briefly now. I mean, like um, my family setup has never been the, the greatest. And, you know, I worked seasonal at Holy Parks when I was younger. But then like in the winter time, I had no family home. My dad passed away when I was 13. Um, my mum went off and remarried and went off and wasn't interested at her own life. And um, so I ended up homeless quite a lot. And through those early 20s, when I was working entertainment, working at the Holy Parks as an entertainer, the same as you did, um, you know, as a, as a blue coat, that kind of entertainer. When I was working, you know, when I had nowhere to to live, live during the summer, uh, during the winter, uh, I spent a lot of Christmases on my own, New Year's Eves on my own, or if I wasn't working. Um, and you know, I, there was suicide attempts and everything else. And you know, I, I always talk about now that I'm a great believer that all the things that we go through in our past, good and bad, give us the ability and the tools to face what we're going to face going forward so i always thought that i was meant to be a singer but actually i look back at it now and i go well the singing actually just gave me the ability to write the poetry because to understand rhythm and everything else that has allowed me to write now over 800 poems in six years um and i've never written anything that's taken me longer than 20 minutes because it literally just like there's someone sat on my shoulder flows from me um and all the tough times I had with, you know, as I said, suicide attempts and everything else has allowed me to kind of have the strength to kind of face what I face now and get through, but also open myself up and talk about these things um, to anyone uh, and help other people. So I'm grateful for those times. I'd go through it all again just to get where I get now. So that's also taught me a lesson that when I'm having bad days, as I still do, you know, have days when I can't face the outside world yeah, yeah. Um, and everything else. Um, I now, through the poetry, kind of, my first thought now is, how can I use what I'm feeling today to talk about that and help other people? Because that's the power of social media, same as you're doing right now, same as what all this is about. It's about using social media for, for good, because, you know, it's got a bad rep, you know, and for rightly so for a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you, you know, we have this ability to, you know, in my, uh, from, from what I'm doing, to write a piece of poetry, it doesn't take 20 minutes, that talks about things that lots of people are going through that they can relate to, click a button, send it around the world to someone in for some far flung corner of the world that I've never even dreamed of going, who's going to read it and be helped by it. And that is such an amazing thing. And that, that has helped me kind of come to terms with what I'm facing. Yeah. Um, like, um, well, like you say, it's, uh, it's, it's helping. So like, obviously when I do these uh, broadcasts live on Facebook, I don't generally know who's watching. It could be somebody from anywhere in the world, you know, that's, you know, unlucky enough to click on my channel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like you've just said there, I mean, your stuff is moving. I mean, I've, uh, you know, I've listened to it, I've heard you, I've spoken to you. So I say thank you, first of all, because obviously you are helping people, but mostly, you know, you are living proof that, you know, one career isn't the be all and end ball. Use it as a stepping stone to, you know, increase and move forward in your career to get to where you want to be in your goals. 100%. Uh, um, so, 
Uh, cool. If you don't mind, I just want to do something quickly. Um, I, don't, I don't normally do this like this, but I want to do it just to kind of give the people out there a real kind of idea. I'm going to read two poems back to back that kind of um, sum a lot of stuff up. Um, so I've, I've talked about RP and, and the condition that I have, uh, been lots of variations of it. Uh, and the particular type that I have been um, affecting one in two every time a child is born. Now, I have two children, as I said. I've got Ellie from a previous relationship, who's now 13, Austin, who's seven. And there's one in two chance that they'll maybe lose a sight when they're older uh, through RP. Um, now, with a particular type that we have, as I said right at the beginning, the first stages generally aren't... Um, pre you don't really present those stages uh, with the type that I have till late teens, early 20s. Um, so we know the carriers, um, but whether it's actually going to impact them, we don't know. But it's one in two every time. I've got a sister, my sister that was first to be diagnosed. She's got two children. Both of them have got it. Um, so that is probably one of the hardest parts with RP about me. Naturally, I feel guilty about that. Um, but also it inspires me to show them, um, you know, all the amazing things you can still do despite visual impairment or low vision or blindness, whatever you want to call it. So I've written poetry about that. Um, there's a couple of poems. I've written a poem for Austin. I've written a poem for Ellie. And I'm going to read you the one uh, I've read. Um, I, re I wrote for my son, Austin, who's seven. It's called Shift This Cloud. I've actually got a part of it tattooed on my arm because it means that much to me. Yeah, and cool. I'm sure a lot of people, whether you live with low vision or not, will relate to these kind of feelings, especially if you're a parent. And it goes like this. How do I break the news of what I may have done to you? Won't know for sure, but doctors say the odds are one in two. I look into your eyes and watch for signs I hope aren't there. Pray this RP will end in me. No faulty gene is shared. This tunnel world I live in hope one day won't be your view. Don't follow in my steps or place foot inside my shoe. The battle for acceptance will be just a story told. With perfect sight, not hurt by light, clear vision break the mould. I carry heavy guilt through sleepless nights and secret tears. I wait to know the answer, ticking clock of RP's fears. But if in future blindness does come knocking at your door, I'll lead you by example, show you life is so much more. My son be proud, we'll shift this cloud and dance in heavy rain. I'll show you all that's possible, strong heart and long white cane. With poems raise awareness, this will be my legacy. Three books will travel round the world, my stand by me RP. So years from now, when you're fully grown, if blindness burden shared, just look at what your dad's achieved so you'll be more prepared. So that's Shift This Cloud. I'm going to read another one back to back before we get back into the chat. Um, this one um, is one that I'm probably most known for within the blind community. It's a, a, po a poem called All the Tears, and this tells my story uh, pretty much to where we've got up to at this, at this point. I wrote this um, when I was lucky enough to be given an, an award a couple of years ago from a charity I'm an ambassador for here in the, uh, the UK, in the northwest of England, called Henshaws, one of the oldest charities in the, uh, in the country, over 180 years old. Big shout out to Henshaws, who are a wonderful charity who support people with low vision and a whole range of other disabilities as well. And uh, when they gave me this award, they asked me to say a speech. I couldn't think of a speech to say. I, I went completely blank. And I thought, what I'll do is I'll put what I want to say in a poem. And this is how it turned out. And this explains my story. And I first read this at an awards ceremony, stood in front of all these dignitaries and all the Lord Mayors of Manchester. And, and uh, this is what I say. All the tears that I have shed and these scars upon my wrist have made me who I am today, prepared me now for this. I wouldn't be so strong if I had never failed before. I'd still be isolated, scared to step outside my door. I'm not saying that I'm over this. Those bad eye days still come. For even now, whilst reading this, I'm blinded by the sun. I'm anxious and my chest is tight. I feel like giving in. But deep inside my heart, I know I'll never let this win. I promised just six years ago when blindness certified. Through poetry, I'd share my tale to others far and wide. So no one ever need to feel alone with losing sight. I explain their thoughts to loved ones through these verses that I write. But never did I imagine that my words could do so much. They've healed the hearts of strangers, opened doors with slightest touch. I'll be a friend, my pride will mend, my purpose clear to see. Three books will be my legacy, my stand by me RP. I know that soon these faces that I look upon today 
will disappear, but I won't fear. These memories will stay. My wife, my sons, my daughter, and here will never age. My love for them is printed in each poem, verse and page. When last has gone, I'll carry on to make my family proud, to be a voice for others, to help them lift this hazy shroud. Inspire them to grab a cane and step outside their homes. Four words, each poem's message, saying you are not alone. Here you go. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Again, like you say, these these are just literally not even. You've got to start it again. Oh, can you hear me? Hear me now. Hear me now. Uh, I think it's just uh, to and from. We might give it a second. Are you with me now? I'm sure I'm coming through okay yep, on again. social media. I'd like to hope so. Can't hear a word. You can't hear a word. Bear with me two seconds. I should be able to. Nope. Oh. Any better. Power of social media. Power of social media. That's it. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm hoping that I can be heard. If you can hear me, I hear please do. It's, it's right. really distorted. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's really distorted. It's really distorted. Okay. Hang on two seconds. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um... Okay. Keep talking. I'll tell you when. Can you hear me now? Can you nope. hear me now? Right. Uh, bear Something's me. changed. I don't know what. Uh... Is that any better? No, you start to come through a little bit clearer then. I don't know what you're doing, but... Can you hear me now? No, I'm still destroyed. <laughs> uh... Any better? Am I back? Nope. No? Oh, I do love this. I do love this. Any better? You may want to ask if it's now? just me or... Yeah, if it's the you. people right. on Facebook. Can anybody hear me on Facebook? Just put yes or no, because they're... Uh... I'm having. I can't is, hear you uh, at all. You can't hear me at all. Uh, if you can. Sounds hear like me, you. Sounds you. like you're a motorbike. <laughs> Any better? Can you hear me now? No. Now, 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 now. I can hear you both. Right, Clark apparently can hear. Yeah, me. it sounds like a loose connection somewhere. I don't know where or. It might be you, Dave. It might be your internet connection because we've been on for a while. It may be because everybody else can hear us fine. They can hear us loud and clear, Dave. It's really weird. All right, hang on. Hopefully, hopefully it will come back in because everybody else on social media can hear us, Dave. Can you hear me? Everyone can hear us, okay? <laughs> hang on. Uh, right, we're gonna we're gonna try and get Dave back on in a minute. Bear with me two seconds. We'll just see if it's just a case of the the stream link. You're back. You're back. You're back. Can you hear me now? Yay, there we go. Yeah, okay, so it's just the stream link because of the system. Okay. Oh, social media and technology. Um, right, if anybody has a degree in production, please do get in contact. <laughs> you know, feel free to help the show out, you know, obviously free of charge. Right, so, okay, so we've gone through the poetry. Thank you very much. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And again, we will send you links to be able to go to the Blind Poet Dave Steele's Facebook page, just be able to see his YouTube that he's just recently started getting back on. He's on Instagram. He's he's everywhere. So make sure you do stay in contact. But if you don't mind, we're going to take a bit of a dip and I'm going to play devil's advocate. And if possible, I'm going to ask you some questions about absolutely. sight please loss please. and hopefully, like you say, put a dampener on the stigma about what you can, what you can't do. Yeah, so these questions I have, some of these have been proofread. Um, we've, as you all know, I do speak to my guests prior to coming on the show, what we can talk about, what we can't talk about. But Dave has given us the green light to pretty much just ask away. There's no offensive question. It's better to know now than not at all. So sight loss, the word blind. So when somebody says, oh, you know, I'm blind, again, somebody with naivety, that means I can pretty much wave my hand in front of your face, pull a funny face, la, 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 la. You can't see it. It's not going to bother you. What does the word blind mean? It's very vague. Please explain. Yeah, so I mean, blindness is a spectrum. So yeah. you know, it's it's never all or nothing. Um, you know, there are people. You know, lots of people that are completely blind, um, but the majority of people are like myself. Um, you know, ninety three percent of people who are classed as visually impaired or blind have some kind of useful vision. Um, it's only seven percent that actually have no light perception and can see nothing at all. There are lots of different eye conditions. The eyes are very, very complicated things. And there are lots of different ways of seeing. So I talked about RP being peripheral loss, you know, going inwards. 
and you, you lose your peripheral vision and then your central vision. There are other conditions uh, like macular degeneration and star guards and things like that where you lose it the other way around. So actually you lose your central vision first, but they still have peripheral vision, which that's really weird. But if you think about it, um, you know, a lot of uh, that stereotypical when people say, you know, oh, you, you don't look blind. They'll think of a blind person as maybe someone whose eyes are maybe looking up to the side. Have you ever seen yes. that before? Yes, yes. So if you think of someone that has got um, uh, um, what I just spoke about there, a condition where they've lost their central vision, but they've still got peripheral. So that would mean that the way they see is in in their view, uh, their vision, there would be a, bl a blind spot in the middle of their vision but they've got clear vision on the outside of their vision. So in order to be able to see that, they kind of like they're looking on the outside of their vision. So that's why tem people tend to kind of look up uh, or to I'm the side of that. I'm going to do a, a random social experiment using my toolbox that happens to be beside me. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm literally going to I'm going to see if this works. So as you would say, so anybody, I'm going to put this up to my camera. Uh, obviously, Dave, you may or may not be able to see this experiment, but okay. if I do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. See what you're doing there. Right, so if you can still see the middle there, you kind of got. Like, no, I've yeah. gone away from the mic. But you've got yeah. a tunnel vision, which is like you've lost the outside vision. I'll tell you, a, a great way of describing it was, yep. right? Imagine, right? Imagine you sat on a train. Yes. Okay, you're on a train and it's night time, okay? Yes. And, well, not night time, it's, day, it's dusk. Say it's dusk, okay? Right? okay? And. Um, it's half past so, three. Yeah, it's half past three. Okay, quarter four. <laughs> Make it quarter four. <laughs> the win the window is kind of like conden condensation and misted up. Yeah. Yep. If you take your thumb and you do a thumb imprint on the window and have that clear bit, and then the rest is all kind of fogged. Yeah. That would be what RP is like. So you'd have a clear bit of vision yep. of, uh, of some kind of size, and then the rest a bit clouded, like dotted kind of pigment, and then the rest nothing there. Right. So as you so, said, yeah, go on. Sorry. So you, you can actually get these things. Most charities now will do these kind of things called vision sim specs. And basically what they are is, remember the old, um, like, 3D glasses you used to get, like cardboard you used to put, put around you? Yes. Remember the 3D glasses, yeah? So imagine, like, a, a, you know, a set of, like, ca cardboard kind of specs, but instead of there being the lenses there, it's just two holes, pinholes. Mm -hmm. So you can you can actually make something look like this up yourself. Get, get a piece of paper and poke a little hole for it. And, and, and then imagine trying to get around with just that little kind of dot of vision. Right. I, I will do. So, again, so that's obviously a form of blindness. So, like you say, not the word blind, you can't just yeah. say, you can't just say, right, oh, I'm blind. And people just go, right, okay, well, I but know, most people, I know. That's where the yeah. big common com mis And the, the problem is, you know, it's, it's no one's fault. It's a lack of education, lack of awareness. I used to think it before yeah. i started losing my sight you know so it's perfectly normal but the only problem with that is is that um people naturally become isolated and anxious due to low vision and, and, and having a diagnosis of blindness but because there's these common kind of preconceptions of what blindness is is and what it looks like as well people will often say to me and many others oh you don't look blind and that's one of the worst things you could say to someone with a vision impairment. <laughs> this, what, you know, what does blindness look like? Blindness looks like anyone because, you know, it's an invisible disability. Yes. Um, so, you know, the problem with that is that people then, like me, tend to not apply for a guide dog or not use a cane because they feel like they're not blind enough. They think that, oh, I've got to be completely blind to use a cane or completely blind to use a guide dog. And I'll often say to them, well, hang on a minute, okay, let me ask you this question. Do you find yourself not going out to certain places because of your vision? Do you find yourself yeah. like avoiding busy places or dimly lit places like bars and restaurants and not going out to them as much anymore or living your life as much as you used to do because of the way your eyes are? Yes. In that case, you're ready. You can use a cane. Yeah. You can use a guide dog. If it's going to help you, you can do it. But people often think because they don't look blind or don't um, fit into these perceived bo boxes of what blindness is, that it's too soon for them to apply for a cane or a guide dog, and they end up becoming isolated. And also because of those misconceptions, the way people get judged in public from people who are, don't have that awareness and some people who were just rude about it, 
I have often been shouted at in the street or looked at suspiciously for making eye, eye contact with someone while I'm using McCain or having assistance at a train station to help me through a busy platform. I then get seated on a train or a plane. I then pull my phone out, phone out and I'm watching a thing on YouTube or watching a film or, you know, on Facebook and people were like, oh, he's, he's faking it. And because of those misconceptions, that isolates people like myself and people, um, you know, will shut themselves away and not go out more. Yeah. Um, so are you saying so the people are locking themselves away not because of the the condition itself it's the response from the outside world that yeah. is smashing your confidence to bits because you're worried that because you're you know you're you have a sight deficiency and it's not like you say don't, don't not, use sight deficiency oh, okay sorry go on no go on that's <laughs> so what I mean. yes go for it. absolutely Please, don't be afraid to call it blindness sight loss right. visual impairment whatever uh, okay. sight deficiency you know I, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> right, so blindness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> If absolutely. people are leaving the house, people are leaving the house, and like you say, their confidence is being smashed because, you know, it's a case of if I want help for somebody to go, right, I'm new in town, could you please help me to get to the nearest bus stop, you know, and then once I'm on the bus, I'm pretty much safe. Somebody's meeting me on the other end. But like you say, I can get my phone out. I can quite easily send a text because you've got modern technology. It's big screen. Well, you can send a text that. and I mean, say, you know, you know. People with, with, with low vision, blindness, sight loss, whatever what you call it, if they get the right training, are perfectly capable of doing it themselves. Yeah. You know, they, they don't, you know, if they need help, they'll ask for it. You don't mm. need to, you know, people, that we're, we're so lucky with, you know, the t technology we've got out these days you know whether it be you know devices you know act things that are built up as as, as accessible tech with you know with, with canes and everything else mm. um you know people are, are capable of doing that you know i i i and this is you know another thing we'll talk about i'm sure a lot of people can, can relate to out there i um i know people including myself who um have been accused of you know not being able to bring up my child safely because yeah. of my visual impairment now i know blind parents where mum and dad are both blind and they've got no useful vision and they've brought kids up perfectly yeah because with the right training right support right assistance right tools um people can live with a visual impairment, disability, blindness, whatever, and be more than capable. Yes, there's certain things that we need assistance with through a device or support, but, you know, you are more than capable of living a full life. Right. Well, yeah. So if we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through some questions that I've got, and we'll literally just... Can I ask you one question before we, we push on? Yes, please do. Honestly, right? Yes. And this is to your viewers out there as well. If you saw... A, a woman with a newborn baby in a pram walking down the street with the pram in one hand and a cane in the other. Yeah. What would be your first in instincts? What would you think? Me, per well, me personally, uh, it's a it's a it's a weird one to ask would me. You question. Because, yeah. Well, the, it's a weird one to ask me because you know, obviously I haven't been in entertainment for 10 years and I've done jobs in between and I've actually been working as a support worker for people with sight deficiencies and stuff like that and, uh, and blindness. But, again. And, but yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. But I've, I've worked with people with all sorts of disabilities. So now in my life, I don't judge people or look at people. I just think, you know, people are getting on with getting on in their own way. But yes, the question itself to anybody that maybe hasn't done what I've done you know, if I go back 10 years myself, I would be like, well, how can you do that? How can you push a pram and look after a baby, but you generally are struggling to see where you're going? How would, you know, surely that's not, that's not, that's not going to work would be my answer 10 years ago. Yes. And, and a perfectly natural question to ask, but there lies the, the actual real truth of it. Um, it's about keeping an open mind and not judging not presuming you think you know ask the yeah. question whether yeah. you ask it to the person is one thing because it might be con you know said a rude to just walk up to a stranger and say are you safe pushing that pram but find out you know if, if you're thinking that oh you know we've we, we, we live in an age where we've got google and we've got so much information right at our fingertips and and yeah. a lot of us are too busy watching cat videos 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> wrong with camera deals, but you know, I'm just saying that you know, I talk to my kids all the time, and they say like, when we had to study for an exam, when we were kids, we had to go out and find the information. We couldn't just pull out our phones. Yeah, and it, it, you know, education now has completely changed with 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 the internet because all the information is there at the touch of a button, but yeah. rarely do people actually use it properly to its full um, potential, rather than yeah, just exactly. writing nasty um, comments on somebody's videos. Yeah, Please exactly. So, you know, <laughs> think about it. Don't don't just judge, you know, and that's yeah. and that, that's the key. So, in regards to questions then, so, right, if, so, we're going to, you can answer the questions, obviously, from your own experience, but maybe on a broader scale from, you know, everybody else that you may or may not have come across. So, again, playing devil advocate, I'm asking the questions, right, I see you walking down the street, you have your cane, right. Are you happy for somebody, you know, at the perfect place or time to ask you, obviously you have, uh, you're blind, but do you mind if I ask you in what shape or form? Is that an offensive thing to ask somebody? No, um, it's the person's right to whether they want to answer it or not. Yep. Um, I, what I would say in my personal experience, if it is done politely, then yep. absolutely, but that's the kind of person I am. Yep. Somebody else might not feel comfortable talking about it, and that's yep. their right to do so. But as long as you ask in a um, a, a perfectly nice and respectful manner, that you know, that, then that's all you can do. But you know, just as long as you do it, you know, with knowing that they are not some just because you see a blind person in the street doesn't mean that they're a spokesperson for the entire blind community, of course. and they have a responsibility <laughs> to answer your questions to educate you. Right. Um, so, you know, it's up yep. to the person. Um, but you know, in my own experience, if someone does it, absolutely. Okay. Oh my God, you've got such a cute dog. Can I please pet your dog? Um, no, if my guide dog is working, um, you cannot. So if a guide dog is in harness, um, the reason why um, it's not um, a good thing to do is when a guide dog is working, they are concentrating on their job, which is keeping that person safe. And um, dogs, by their very nature, can be distracted very, very easily. Guide dogs are trained to kind of not be, but they can still get distracted at other dogs, at um, food, at someone wanting to say hello. So if you kind of go up and pet someone while a guide dog has got that harness on and working, two minutes later they're distracted. They, um, you know, take – take, uh, someone off a curb it's across a road and um don't see a car and it puts someone in danger yeah. so you know it's um when when a guide dog's not working or you know i i'm different with mine so certain people will say when they're in a harness um not at all but i'm i say if i am sat down somewhere in a cafe or a bar and the guide dog's on the floor and obviously not doing anything um please you know come up and be respectful don't just walk up and pet him but come up and ask then that's perfectly cool yeah. um but if they're if i'm out in the street and i'm moving about um you know don't try and let your dog near them or let your kids yeah. try and stroke them or let onto them or whatever on the back of that then obviously that's public and obviously strangers in the household though is christopher that is his name isn't it he's, yeah absolutely he's, 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 he's christopher he's, he's just he's just a pet he's the dog he's, you know he's he sits the dog. on the, he's the sofa house. with he's everybody and... yeah he's another member of the yeah. family he's just you know yeah. It's only when he's only when he's actually physically working. Um, yeah. Once he put, puts that harness on, it's like putting a cape on. Da -da -da -da, and away yeah. he goes. Um, but yeah. How do blind people know what to wear in the morning and they're not wearing shirts backwards? Uh, again, well, I'm playing again, devil's advocate. These are not yeah, stupid absolutely. questions from me. I'm asking the question. How do you know there's what a, a person's wearing in the morning? There's a great um, YouTuber um, uh, by the name of... Oh, God, I'm not going to remember her name now. Not, that's terrible. I forgot her name. <laughs> Uh, it'll come to me uh, anyway um there's a there's a, a, a young girl who does tiktoks and, and youtube she's actually the first radio uh one presenter who's blind and she's completely blind and she does videos and all these sort of things yeah, yeah. um you know i think it's just a case of like feel touch you know um people who are completely blind adapt the senses very well to kind of know you know it's easy to feel if the labels in the back of thing you know people have been known to go out and things that don't match even i've you know done it on occasions where i've been having a bad idea and i can't see well um, i mean that's another thing as well is uh, um you know people think if you've got a visual impairment that you see one particular way all the time and i want to make that very clear it's not the case 
Um, I have good and bad eye days. I have days where I feel like I can see fairly well, days when I don't. I My sight can change on a minute to minute basis depending on lots of different variants. If I'm ill, if the weather is a certain way, if it's not too, if it's too light, too dark, um, it also depends on my view as well because my retinas are the things that are affected and the retina is the thing that takes the 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 signal of what your the eyes are seeing and send it to the brain for that to translate because my retinas can't deal with complicated signals or views what happens is if i'm in a park um or a place and there's not much in my view it's quite an open space apart from my loss of peripheral i feel i can see fairly clearly but then if i turn a corner and all of a sudden there's lots of moving objects i.e people or cars or whatever and lots of information for my eyes and retinas to kind of deal with it can't deal with that signal it scrambles and all of a sudden in a split second it's like i'm in a complete fog and i go completely blind it's like i'm in a sauna a mist yeah. um and uh and so you know that can be very bring on anxiety of your sight just like in a split second changing so there's lots of different variants that I mean i see in different ways at different times Right. Um, and that, okay. that's often hard to deal with. Yeah. Again, again, playing devil's advocate, asking the stupid questions so they don't have to. How am I? Go how on earth do you have all your fingers and you haven't chopped anything off by trying to prepare your own meals? Surely you can't <laughs> hey, feed yourself. I've gotten close. You know, I mean, I do. I do the majority of the cooking in the house um, because my wife says, you know, while you can do something, do it. And I enjoy cooking. Um, and often I have, you know, I do spill things. I break glasses, break plates knock things over, um, get frustrated with myself for doing it, set tea towels on fire because I've not seen something out of my peripheral. Um, it's quite often, but, you know, I do that, but I, I try not to let it stop me. Um, what I have to do is just sometimes uh, remember that I'm visually impaired and um, it, instead of, you know, clicking into autopilot, try and slow myself down to try and stop these accidents. But I had a thing a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago now, actually, where, I'd made a Sunday morning breakfast for everyone, the family, and, you know, took my time, bacon, sausage, everything, set, you know, put everything out on the table, poured myself like a pint of fresh orange juice, sat everyone down, you know, all pleased myself. I'd had no accidents, went to grab the salt off the table, knocked the pint glass because it was out my peripheral all over my son's breakfast and got really down on myself, you know, and yeah. just frustration. Ah, why have I done that? Blindness getting in the way again. Um, so, yeah. Like you say, if anybody does have any questions, quickly stick them in the comments. We will ask, obviously, Dave. Uh, right. So, from going from one, let's go to the funnies because we've spoken about this then. So, yeah, obviously, there are down days, but sometimes you get a little bit of a preve and sometimes funny things do happen such as you've 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 explained you've you've uh, you've said to me like uh the comical value that you're standing right into to cross the road and somebody will flash their lights at you yeah that, that happens quite a lot you know yeah i mean you talk about not judging but that's the other end of the spectrum where you know you've literally got someone with a guide dog and like, someone in a van flashing the light saying go and it's like you know okay you Come think on. i can see yeah i mean i can but you know so anyway um also another little thing as well which i don't know if you've mentioned to you next time you go to a crossing you know, yes. like the one, the button crossings that you have to press, where it says wait, yes. stuff, like a normal kind of crossing. Yes. And um, if you press the button and then hold to just to the right, underneath the the, the rectangle unit, mm -hmm. right? Do this next time you go. You, you, this will blow your mind. If you feel underneath it, just on the right hand side, there's a little kind of cone that sticks out on the corner. And okay. what that does is that's there for all visually impaired people. And what it does is when you press the button. Um, when the lights are on green, the cone underneath it spins round so you can feel it. Right. So, so for someone that, you know, if it's got no sound or and you can't see the lights, you can feel the cone underneath and it tells so you So that from. cone underneath is not so you're meant to turn it so then you can quickly turn. No, so it spins itself. <laughs> it spins itself. When see, it's as a kid, we used to just grab that and thought, if we keep spinning I, I never that underneath, it, it will change the lights. <laughs> Yeah, it's I like it was also there, on, but I didn't know what it was for. On yeah. pavements as well, when you always see by crossings, you see it kind of like bobbly, you know, like the little yeah. bobbly kind of paving stones. Yeah. And that's tactile for someone with a cane to feel with the cane to know that they're at a crossing. All right. Again, it's not to, in, to tell people to get you, the heck You wouldn't know these things. Again, you know, uh, I'm saying. 
but yeah, yeah, you know, my site's got me into lots of kind of funny, awkward predicaments. Uh, you know, I go to the gym quite often. When I first started training at the gym, I'd often sit on a piece of equipment and realise I'd sat on some bloke's knee, <laughs> you know, or tripped over someone, um, you know, doing push-ups on the floor because I'm not seeing them. And I'm not using my cane in the gym uh, to get around. I'm just, you know, it's, a, it's a, a place where I'm fairly familiar with. So I'll just kind of use my tunnel of vision and scan around to get to where I need to go. Um, but yeah, before, the, the story I always tell, which I told you, which I'll tell your viewers now, is before I started losing, before I was officially diagnosed with RP, when I was working as a singer many moons ago, I'd had a couple of days off from doing some gigs, I had some downtime on a, on a kind of run of doing shows down south, I was in Kent or Essex or somewhere, checked into our hotel because I was sick of staying in caravans, and uh, went down to use the gym, in the gym for a little bit in the afternoon, went to use the sauna and this was said before when I was probably in denial still about my RP when I just had the night blindness but could kind of get on with things mm. um, and um, went to use the sauna, opened the door to the sauna and all the steam started to come out. It was quite dark in there. So I stood right in the doorway waiting for my eyes to kind of adjust to the light, you know, like I spoke about earlier and um, you know, waiting to try and find somewhere to sit. And it took about a minute for my eyes to adjust to the light and the steam and to my horror, when um, when my eyes adjusted, I realised that there was one woman on her own sat in the sauna. And basically what I'd done is open the door, stand in the doorway like that for a minute, just staring straight at her. That's about five seconds. Literally about a minute like that. And then walked in. And as soon as I got in and sat down, she just like, left she was like you know who's this creepy guy what's this what, what, you know, trying to press the panic button uh, so you know these, these these kind of things happen you get yourself into these situations but you just kind of gonna laugh and uh, and get on with it i think uh there's not enough time in the day really to you know to go through absolutely everything that we could talk about today uh but what i'm gonna do is again i'm gonna plug it so you've got your youtube up so that's just the blind poet is it on yeah, the YouTube? Blind Poet channel, uh, if you put in the Blind, blind Poet, poet channel, because there's a few different Blind Poets, but I mean, one of the good things I'm very proud of is if you go to, uh, if you go to Google now and you just yep. type in the Blind Poet, all loads of stuff comes up on me. There's so much stuff out yep. there at the moment, news articles and this, that and the other. Um, yep. So, you know, you've got my website, which is theblindpoet.net. Check out the website. That'll kind of link you to everywhere else. My Facebook page, um, which is um, you got the blind poet, and also after the book, the main one, the main support group is called Stand by Me, RP letter R letter P awareness page. Go on that. Yeah. One of the biggest support groups in the world for people with RP, and you can you can see all my poetry on there as well. Um, yeah, but the, the and so YouTube, Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, yeah. you know, and, and and Facebook, but the the the, the, the website. Um, stand by, sorry, the, the blind pipe.net is, is where you'll find most of my stuff. So again, if you are interested in learning more, please do go and head over to these pages and obviously um, send, feel free to send Dave a message. He'll quite happily get Absolutely. back to you. Uh, and will, also, um, I, I, if any, I, I mean, you can get the books on Amazon. I'll give it a shameless plug. Hang on, plug. hang on. There's a question come up. You won't be able to see this. But oh, sure. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Evelyn. All right. Can you, I don't know if you can see that. Where is the best place to buy your book? Thank you. There Evelyn, we go. For, That's a good um, question. So the go. books are on Amazon. Um, Stand by me, RP. Uh, one, two, and, that way. one, two, and three. Um which uh, there's about 80 poems in each book. Um, they're all in large print as standard, as uh, so a larger print than normal. And you can get them on Amazon Kindle as well. So on, you know, Kindle devices, electronic devices. Yep. You don't even need to have a Kindle. You can download the app onto your smartphone, Kindle yep. app, and you can download the books on there. But um, if anyone would like um, any um, signed copies of these books, personally dedicated as a gift for like Christmas or the holidays, um, I've got a limited number of these at the moment. Um, the books are normally about 10, 12, well, I think 12 99 each on Amazon. Um, but I'm doing all three books signed um, and dedicated for £20 um, for all three books. And I'll, I'll sign them, put a little personal message to you know a loved one or anyone. And if you want any of those, you can um, message Jay or you can you know message yeah, yeah. me direct on Facebook or the, any of the Facebook pages um, and, you know, 
I've got a limited amount. You can do that and we'll get them sent out to you before Christmas. Fantastic. So, yeah, I know there'll be people obviously watching from uh, your background as well as my background. So everybody, if that is something that, you know, is relevant to you or if you just like poetry in general, it doesn't have to be about, uh, you know, about blindness and stuff. No, like that. there's lots of poetry is fantastic. Although the poems are written about low vision, um, yes. you know, the people people say to me all the time that actually, um, you know, they don't have to be affected by blindness or low vision to actually relate to the stuff that I talk about because, you know, especially in, in, in today's world, yeah, I'm talking about things like anxiety, isolation, all those social anxiety, all those kind of things. Uh, yeah. And those are things we can all kind of relate to at the moment with the pandemic and COVID and social distancing and everything else. Brilliant. So uh, obviously we had a bit of a mess up earlier on trying to play the video. I will send the link to the video and I will add it to a new uh, Facebook status and on the Instagram and Twitter page. The link to that video as well as Dave's page as well as his Instagram page and everything. I will make sure that you have all the facilities to catch up on. The, there is not enough hours in the day to go through this because we've got a lot of catching up and a lot of more information. And I'm sure people could go over it and you never know in 2021 we may get you back on because you have told me that... Um, you will be going over to the States again, obviously, to do more tours, hopefully, in the future. Yeah, so I'm sure you'll have I, more stories. I was supposed to be out there every six weeks this year up until yeah. the pandemic. I was due to fly out a week before we went to lock. Well, a week after. We went to lockdown a week before I was due to fly out. My bags were packed. I, I'd been um, given the honour, um, amazing honour, of um, being the MC host um, for uh, this year's Helen Keller Awards. Uh, in yep. DC, I don't know if you know who Helen Keller is, but if you don't look her up, an amazing person um, who was deaf blind, um, who is very inspirational, who's, who's no longer with us. But, um, but she, the, it's called, basically it's like the Oscars for blind people. Previous winners have been Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, yep. Apple, uh, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft, you know, lots of big tech companies. And yeah. I was going to be the host. Um, and it oh. was a great honor to be the first British person to ever do that as well um so hopefully i'll be back out there doing that next year and releasing more books and and touring and everything well as i will try and make a point of i will post and repost obviously our previous guests as well as uh, uh, dave's stuff on our page to make sure that everybody stays up to date and stays connected because that's the purpose of our page so rather than saying goodbye to you dave uh which i would normally do and say right you go off and do your thing and uh, go spill some orange juice and breakfast and stuff yeah yeah uh, as i said we've got a connection because uh, <laughs> there is a connection with our next guest and this is a weird connection actually because obviously me and you have been in the entertainment business and we've done our fair share we've done our you know our sentence as they call it you know we've done our show time and then some uh, and then some uh but my next guest i know personally obviously from the past uh, and there's a high chance that y you know you may have met our guest and vice versa at a very young age this would have been back in 2011 the last time i probably saw you in person mm -hmm. um but this uh, young gentleman has grown up into a young adult um and is now entering the show business world of himself so if you don't mind sticking around we're going to introduce onto the show if that's okay the one and only mr harry mcparland good morning hey. good morning hello there he is so i can hear from that accent that you are a little bit further north than me then harry where just, are you just a little bit i am in the west Lothian in scotland west Lothian in scotland have you been there dave nope Something to You're not missing this. much, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, uh, we'll, uh, we'll squeeze you in the middle of that, lovely. Um, all right, so Harry, welcome to the show. Welcome to Chatterday Live. I, I know that you've been uh, obviously a viewer of the show in the past, so you know that that, that normally works. So the link between obviously uh, Dave and obviously yourselves and myself with entertainment as uh, not only a hobby but a career as well. Uh, please fill us in, Harry McPartland. What are you all about? Well, uh, I'm an actor. Um, I've been acting now for probably yep. around six years. Coming up in February, I'll, I'll be in six years of, of acting now. Um, I got into it when I did a little school part of mine in Primary 7. Um, I played Abba Nazar in Aladdin. And from then, I was like, you know what? This is what I want to do. So I looked around. I joined a drama group, Firefly Arts, and got lots of experience from there. And I'm now looking to go into professional training, hopefully by September time this year. All go to plan. Wow. 
So, right, so we'll go into the questions then. So, before we go and ask you any questions, is there any questions that you'd like to ask um, two very successful world renowned entertainers that are sitting beside you now? Any uh, tips that you'd like to get from us before we go into your future? Well, you've got the opportunity, especially with Dave, he knows more than I do. <laughs> I mean, Dave, I'd love to know what your creative process is for sitting down and writing. I know you went into it a little bit, but I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I mean, as far as the process is concerned, I think it's similar to a lot of songwriters. You know, you just kind of get an idea uh, and then just start writing, basically. Just just, just do it. Um, you know, I, I said I've written over 800 in, what, six years now, and nothing's taken longer than 20 minutes. And the reason why is because if it's not coming from the heart, it's not worth writing. So if, if, you know, you're a prime example of this, you and, and my hat's off to you, um, you are following your dreams you were doing you know what you believe you are meant to do uh, yeah. and, and, and it's about sticking with that and if you are if you are coming from a place of genuine passion and genuine heart um then you know that's where you're going to produce your best work you've heard that expression before you know find something that you'll love to do for uh, and do it for a living and you'll never work a day in your life yeah and that's so so true that's something that i tell my children um, and you know, um, and, and especially at this time, this time you know that we're in at the moment, the we all know how difficult um, it is within the entertainment sector, how hard it's been hit in the arts sector. Um, so you know, you've really got to kind of dig in and and keep that belief. Uh, but there'll be plenty of people, you know, like myself and Jay out there, you know, showing you support and uh, and cheering you on. Yeah, we do show support because, like you say. Uh, you know, before we go into you, we will have a, like, a personalised one-on-one -on -one interview with you in a minute, Harry. While we've got everybody here, it's very clear that you know, you've seen it all over the news, social media, that the arts industry has taken a bit of a dive at the moment because place the theatre is shut, people can't entertain anymore in was Entertaining outside up until recently has been, you know, very much frowned upon and now possibly coming back. Who knows? Um... What you say, so I mean, fingers crossed that 2021 is going to be the year of entertainment, and you know, and everybody's going to get right behind the performing arts. Because I'm telling you now, you won't realize something until it's gone. Uh, and I think, like you say, not being able to go and see musicians and bands and theater and performances live, you take it for granted that it's on your doorstep, but when it's taken away completely, you know, from no fault of our own, um, like you say, I'm. Um, we're all looking forward to the art coming back. And fingers crossed, Harry, you're going to be a big part of that, hopefully, in the future. So uh, yes, okay. we look forward to seeing that, yeah. So, again, so where did it come from? Because I don't know. So you've obviously seen me perform live. I do apologize about that. And there's a high <laughs> chance that you may have seen Dave perform live because Dave actually came to the holiday park, which I think that you would have seen me at. Um, so, But Dave didn't look like Tyson Fury's stunt <laughs> at the time. Uh, <laughs> all right. There was a time when <laughs> Dave didn't have the beard, so he was a little bit different, uh, you know, a bit more sharply dressed, ready to ready to the town sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, so where did it start from, Harry? Then where did the idea of, you know, I don't want to be an accountant, I want to, you know, I want to scream from the rooftops and be a performer. Where did your inspiration come from? Yeah, like, like I just said there, it was it was that part of mine I did uh, back in primary school, which feels like such a long time ago, but really it was only like six, which is terrifying. But um, got on the stage, had an audience in front of me, and I just loved it. There's just something, just a real thrill about being in front of people and entertaining. And from there I was like, yeah, I'm enjoying this, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I think with entertainment, you either know or you don't know. If if it if it's in you, you know it's the path that you're going to probably take for a career. You can feel it. It's not if you're nervous about it, which is perfectly fine. You're okay to be nervous, obviously, especially when you're first starting out. But if you feel it that you've come away from something and you've got that you know adrenaline rush and buzz and a high, then you it's definitely a, a step forward. Now, um, in theatre and entertainment, then would um, who are your um, role models, icons? Who are you looking up to? Who do you want to be like? You know. Um, obviously, me and Dave are here, but you don't have to say us. <laughs> <laughs> other, other than you two, of course. Um, of course. A real inspiration of mine is actually David Tennant. Um, he was born pretty much just maybe 10, 15 miles down the road from where I live. He moved to Glasgow eventually, which is a little bit further away. Um, but he, young guy from my area, went on to be David Tennant. He's got such versatility in what he does, both stage and screen. 
So yeah. he's a real role, role model in my yeah. great actor. Absolutely yeah. great. I think with the, I think that you say that you've clearly pointed it out there that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people as well. If you don't live in a city center or somewhere that's, you know, you know, when you say the name and go, that's where I live. If people don't know initially or straight away where you live, which unfortunately Dave and myself don't know, live, we know the name, but obviously it's in Scotland somewhere. Oh, you I probably do. feel like um, you probably I, I, where, feel. Where are you, where are you, where, sorry, where are you from, Harry? Uh, West Lothian, so oh. in between. Yeah, no, where about in between exactly uh, Tiny, tiny little village called Breek. No one's ever heard of it. Called, called what? Breek. Yeah, I know. You know, wow. I, I lived in I lived in Glasgow for ten years, and I toured all over Scotland. Um, and yeah, I, I, I my daughter lives in Glasgow, uh, in in Cambus Lang. Uh, I lived in Lanark, um, and I used to spend a lot of time in Edinburgh. Um, I used to perform at Seaton Sands quite a lot, which is not far from Edinburgh, you know, far from you. But yeah, I used to do all Bathgate and all places like that. Okay, yeah, know. that's where that's just down the road, yeah. The, the point I was trying to get at was that, you know, you, people you don't, don't necessarily. Know. I do. You don't. <laughs> okay, I don't know, but a, a lot of people would take it to say, you know, oh, I'm yeah. from a small little town. It, it, you know, it's going to be difficult to make it in the show business. Well, like you say, David Tennant is probably a household name and some. Uh, and then from where I'm from, you know, we've had people come from uh, originally from Suffolk, where I'm from that again. If you say the town lowest, which is a shout out to anybody that's on lowest that's watching. Um, the band Darkness, everybody knows them. That's where they're from. Uh, and then Manchester, there was like a boy band with, you know, some sort of like tinted glasses and parkers that came from there that nobody really remembers now. No, yeah, there's not I been know, many. I think, it, I think it was, I think they, I think they, yeah, I think they were named after like a, like a, a, drink. a, a drink, yeah, a drink. Yeah. Are they called Fanta? <laughs> I, can't, I think they're called Fanta. Fanta, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's got to be Fanta. Uh, possibly Oasis. We'll, okay, we'll move on. But yes. <laughs> yeah, Pepsi and Shirley. Yeah, Pepsi and Shirley, that's fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I mean, like you say, it's it's a good role model to have. I mean, is that what you want to be? Are you like, do you want to do stage and then move on to like, tv production or are you like so i've heard you do your singing as well that you know i've heard you do your video i am what i am which is very talented uh Thank you. which again i'm i might nick from you and um, post on our page as well because it's uh it's uh, it's always nice to see young talent i mean i class myself old now i mean uh i'm only 34 but in the entertainment industry industry and especially with holiday parks i'm now like a prehistoric dinosaur you know it's uh <laughs> I've gone past the point that, you know, I've passed the torch down to the young 17, 18 year olds that are now coming through and, you know, living their dreams. But, um, yeah, so you started with school performances, obviously primary school. I've seen pictures, obviously, so you've done theatre, you've obviously school production and stuff. I yeah. mean, can you name, uh, you know, we'll see if we can agree to disagree. And obviously Dave's probably seen my theatre shows as well in his time. Give us a, a West End show then that's your favourite. Or give us your top three. Give us your top three. We'll see if we'll agree. Top three. Right. I'll, I'll give you mine after this. Okay. So, oh, this is difficult now. Right. So, I've only seen one in the actual West End. So, that's got to be that's my fine. top favourite, I think. Um, and that was The Lion King. And it was honestly incredible that the whole, like puppetry of that is amazing mm -hmm. um then i did lee Miz a few years ago so i've Lame seen is, that yeah. in edinburgh yeah. that's ama an amazing show as well um <laughs> see ah <laughs> don't worry you're not going to offend anyone i don't think anyone <laughs> is sitting here now with like really camera mackintosh is watching right now <laughs> that's the one, yeah. so. um a show it's maybe not as big actually i saw Friend of mine did it. Um, it's spam a lot. It's a musical oh, based on the Monty Python yeah. films. I so, love yeah. that as well. I've never laughed so much at a performance. It was. Okay, it was so incredible. We've got Lion King. We've got Spam Lame a lot. And Lame is. I mean, Lame is is you know it's up there. You know it's pretty big. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. go on, Dave, go for it. Like mine, mine are number three, uh, and it's changed recently. It's always yep. there was always one that was up at the top, but that's now been knocked off its perch. Okay. So number number three is Lame is for me. Yep. Number two, which was the number one forever and a day, um, was Miss Saigon. Ooh, um, nice. I love, love Miss Saigon. I've seen it God knows how many times. Absolutely love it. Used to sing a lot of the songs from Saigon. And everything. But number one now, um, which I think is just the greatest musical of all time, is Hamilton. Um, Hamilton. Yep. It's incredible. If you've not seen it yet, it's worth 
um, getting Disney Plus just to just to watch <laughs> Hamilton. Um, incredible. We're in sport by Disney Plus. There are other services available. But uh, yeah, okay. Well, it, can I join in? Do you mind? Yeah, of course. Is, is that okay? Uh, I, the wife took me by the hand because I wasn't really a theatre buff. You know, I thought, well, you know, there's not really much that can like top my performance as you two probably well know. But you know, she took me to uh, to London and we saw Wicked, which Great, I thought yeah. was pretty good. Awesome. Uh, the wife would agree. She's downstairs with Hamilton. She again, she like many other thousands, probably millions of people, as you just stated there, when she knew that it was coming on to Disney Plus. She was like a child, legs yeah. crossed downstairs, told my 19-month-old boy to disappear for an hour and a bit uh, so she could watch Hamilton. Uh, but she's seen Western things like that. So she'd, I'd have to say that that's probably a big thing. But I am I think Chicago's pretty good, mm-hmm. you know, for what mm-hmm. it is. I mean, if I'm, like, stretching a leaf out there, you know. But, um, yeah, I think... You know, if I if I say really my my honest one is that I love watching, um, you know, Les Mis. It is mm-hmm. what it is. It's yeah. it's it's a performance and a half. I mean, yeah. I guess if we don't want to offend anybody, anybody else who's watched there, maybe not a theatre buff, we do and we really do still appreciate Phantom of the Opera. It is still a classic. <laughs> don't worry, we we <laughs> haven't ju- we haven't disappeared from it. It is still a classic. It's, um, it's funny. So, actually, I, I just, Go on. So I, just really, I actually did um, a musical in the West End. Um, I did a touring musical in my younger days, which shut I don't, the front door. You don't even know <laughs> this yet. Yeah, I. Um, it was a. It was a um, by Bill Kenwright, who produced Blue, uh, Blood Brothers. It was called Robin Prince of Sherwood. It was a rock version of Robin Hood, and um, the uh, I was Alan Alan Dale. And the guy that played um, Robin is a, a guy, if you don't know him, look him up, um, Harry. He's called Earl Carpenter. And he was um, the original um, Garson. Is it Garson? Not Garson. He was, he was the, um, the, 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 the bad guy in Beauty and the Beast. That'd be Garson. Gaston. Oh, yeah. Gaston. Gaston. He was the original Gaston. He was one of the original Phantoms. And he was also in Lame Miz as well. And he's in... Um, He's in the, the, the anniversary concert, uh, uh, um, Earl Carpenter. Yeah. I reckon it's the name. Yeah, if, yeah, f- fantastic. Yeah, and I got to, I got to stand on the West End stage, did Bournemouth Pavilion, Empire Theatre in Liverpool, and yeah, awesome. Harry, I'm sure there's going to be other, other musicals and whatnot coming along down the road, you know, in your time that is to come, you know, in the acting viz. Uh, but if you had a dream role now, any in the world, that dream role, go for it. Who's it? What's your dream role? I've only recently discovered my dream role after uh, becoming slightly obsessed with uh, the musical Jersey Boys. Okay. Um, I would love to be one of the Jersey Boys. Best costumes, best choreography, the tunes. You've got it. the look. You've got the look. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Got the, the swagger there with the old hair. Yeah, you've got it going, I reckon. We'll, uh, we'll have to w- chase that up. You know, yeah. we'll, I'll yeah, get my people to call sense, James though. people and we'll get people to, you know, we'll we'll make it happen. You know, we're, we're, we're really <laughs> up there. You know, people don't say If we can't get you the Jersey boys, we'll get you the Isle of Wight or something like that. Yeah, we'll we'll Works for me. <laughs> or just the Jersey from River Island. What are yeah. that? I don't know. Um, right. So, um, okay. Let's go through some of these questions then. So, um, let's go. Right. So, right. So acting itself, then it's not something that you've done in your bedroom, then. So you've taken acting classes. I'm guessing how you know how does that start and work out then? So after I did that part mine in primary, um, I was like, right. I, I literally I made a I made a Facebook post and was like, right, I want to be an actor, but I don't know how. How do I do it? And various comments of, oh, you need to go to drama school, and drama school is very expensive. Um, so we found a local drama group called Firefly Arts, where I've been now for almost six years. And it's been various training exercises, opportunities. I've done loads of performances with them, as well as weekly workshops that I attend. Obviously, that's changed just now due to the the current situation. But in normal times, I would say, sometimes leading up to a show, I was there practically every day of the week. All right. So... What happens at drama school then? Is everybody just walking around pretending to be trees? I mean, you know, <laughs> what, what's uh, what's drama school then? So, or we, um, what, else, what does this do? Sometimes we have exercises where we walk about and pretend to be trees. We're not going to pretend that doesn't happen. Um, but um, we focus on various 
disciplines, if you like, of the arts. So some some weeks we'll focus on improvisation, maybe um, physical skills, vocal skills. Uh, a lot of devising work happens, which involves a lot of improvisation. We're putting scenes together, performing them to the rest of the group, getting feedback, and that helps us improve as artists. All right. So would you recommend anybody that's into musical theatre or even just thinking about it, like a good way to dip your toe into the idea of it, you know, just go to a drama school and just see what it's all about? Yeah, even it doesn't even have to be a drama school. You know, there's so many amateur, to use the words, um, amateur drama groups in local areas that you can join. They'll put performances on um, annually, monthly, however often they, they, they work. Um, yeah. And it's brilliant just to gain experience and to be in front of the audience. And before, if, if it's a career you're thinking about, you don't want to commit and give all your time to it straight away in case you decide a few months down the line, you know, maybe this isn't for me. So if you join one of these groups, you're going to get experience and work out, is this what I want to do? Right. So if anybody's watching who's thinking about, you know, possibly getting in the, the biz of show, uh, then yeah, <laughs> go and uh, check out your local drama groups. I'm sure there'll be face pages for your local area. You know, they'll yeah. point you in the right direction. So, um, again, we'll go through these notes and obviously questions. So, already at such a young age, would you say that you have regrets of any sort, shape, or form? Go for yeah, it. a little bit. Um, nothing major, obviously, because I am quite young at the moment. Um, there's opportunities that I just knock back, and I can't, I can't think of any opportunities, any, any examples just now. Um, there's stuff I'm like, oh, I'm too tired, I, I can't be bothered, but really. I could have done it, and then other performances. I was like, you know what, this isn't for me, but I just didn't give it enough, didn't give it enough time. Yeah, and that would have been another experience I could have had, and I didn't. Yeah. So I do regret yeah. that. I think when it comes to acting, I think a lot of lesson is that you know you're never bigger than any performance, and then sometimes it's a case of, you know, if you want a, a performing CV, sometimes you've got to be, you know, the sheep. And sometimes you've got to be the main role. So, you know, and it's always good and humbling, which I think already at a young age, you've now learned that lesson, you know, yeah. as if to say, you know, you know, commit yourself to something, you know, regardless what be your idea, you know, because it could lead on to bigger and better things. So at a young exactly. age, thank God you've figured out that lesson already. <laughs> um, again, so uh, proudest moments, go for it. I mean, do you have a, a proud moment already then? Where are you at? Yes, uh, we were very, very lucky this year. Um, mm -hmm. about the start of last year, we started working, me and another three guys, we co-directed, co-acted and co-designed our own performance. We did uh, Bouncers by John Gobber, um, four person play about four bouncers in Hull and it's a play that we would call multi-role. So we also switched to um, Irish women with handbags, which was Really something when we dance to Shania Twain's Man I Feel Like a Woman live on stage. Um, no shame. Um, <laughs> we played young lads, we played some scouts guys, and we put this all together ourselves for uh, the SCD One Act competition, which is something that runs all across the UK in various countries under different names. Um, and it's basically a one act play competition in various districts. So we were, I believe, we're the Eastern District for us. Hopefully I've got that right. Um, and the youth group doesn't have a, a grand uh, British final, the adult group does. Um, but we went on to win our our first year, our, our district heats, I believe. Yeah, if that's the correct name. So we got through that, and then we're in the district final. Um, and we got second place and best moment of theatre. Uh, that was for the school as well. So we were the first student led production. And we were the first mm -hmm. group from our school to actually win any trophies from the competition at all. And we came away with two. So, Wow, credit to you. Well done. Pretty well, uh, which again, I think is just a testament. It's the idea of, you know, pushing forward and uh, breaking boundaries, you know, and, you know, investing. Uh, obviously, some of you, just while I'm here, you've noticed that Dave's left. I'm, I'm guessing that's either for some personal reason. He would have said goodbye. He may come back. Who knows? But uh, thank you very much, Dave. If you're still watching somewhere or shape or form, thank you very much for being on the show. We will plug his stuff. Um, right. So we'll go into some other stuff then. So we've done your dream role and stuff like that. So the future. I mean, you're... You know, we've had our pre-interview and stuff like that. So what's coming mm -hmm. up? Where are we going to be able to see you? What's going on? Go for it. 
So I have recently filmed um, a pilot episode for a web series. It's called mm-hmm. U-Turn. And that was that was meant to be being released. The first episode was meant to be being released around about now. But as the industry often works, um, some unexpected stuff came up. And we're going to have to do some reshoots, which we're hoping to do very, very soon. So it looks like the episode will become available next year. Okay. Um, as well as that, I also recently just filmed a short film just a few weeks ago. Um, I believe there's one more scene that needs to be filmed with one of the other actors. And then that's edited together and should be good to go. And I'm, I'm hoping it will be good to go this year, the end of the year, but we'll just wait and see. Okay. So again, it's probably best to keep an eye on your Facebook page as well, which is just... Yeah, it's... Uh, we'll copy a link in that. We'll do a post for that as well after the show so people can catch up. Um, I think with, uh, like you say, with acting in general and what's coming up in the future, um, how, your personal view, how do you after covid expect you know the theater itself to get to get back i mean are we probably going to be seeing a different you know to what we've seen in the past kind of theater experience i mean do you have any insight or personal opinion on what you reckon is probably going to be the future um it's so unpredictable at the moment unfortunately the way i see it we are gonna once we have opened up again whenever that will be um it's going to be, I think it's going to be really emotional for, for some of us. I know I feel quite emotional sitting in an audience, something I've not been able to do since March. Hmm. Um, I feel like we're going to have very decreased capacity for yeah. audience to begin with, which is expected because that's the same everywhere. Um, we're going to see a lot less people on stage, I think, as well, um, which hmm. the way you look at it could be good, could be bad. It depends on the stories that we're going to tell because we're going to have stories to tell and when we come out of this. Uh, heavy themes of isolation and loneliness, which is important in these times to raise awareness of that. Yeah, I think, like you say, it's going to be, I mean, yes, we are in the middle of a pandemic and fingers crossed we're coming out the other side of it sooner rather than later. But people's experiences and what you find is that traumatic, hopefully not too bad, but obviously experiences in life and in the globe is that it does spur on a story. Uh, and I've seen, obviously, that there is a movie being made about a pandemic, obviously, and the yeah. outcome. Uh, I can't I think it's based in 2024 or something like that. Uh, it's Michael remember. Bay. There'll be a lot of explosions. <laughs> yeah, <I can. laughs> but that's a prime example of taking something that's uh, maybe not so, you know, so good and turning it into a good experience, obviously, as movies and roles and obviously performances. And probably we're going to find a lot more stage performances are probably going to be a representative as well. And like yeah. you said, there may be, rather than full-on productions, it may be that it may be that we're having bubble casts and you might find there's going to be more four- to five-man performances rather than 30-man performances, you know, to try and limit everything. Which is fine yeah. in a way, but at the same time, it's disheartening. But fingers crossed, the theatre itself comes back because you know any art form, whether it be music, theatre, you know, acting, performing in any shape or form, is you know, as I've said before, it's lacking. We do miss it, regardless of whether we noticed it or not. But we do mm-hmm. miss it for the people that are in the arts industry. We apologise. We you know we miss you. We can't wait for you to all be back. So whoever's watching this, obviously we we, we do miss you. We want you back in the arts, whatever shape or form you do. Uh, and as well, obviously for those that like just generally going to watch a performance, whether it be your local band or an artist of any shape or form, or like you say, go to the West End, having a trip to London or your local theatres and see performance. Fingers crossed, it comes back soon. So. We've gone through obviously your dream role of what you know you like to go with the old Jersey boys. Uh, I mean, are you are you more into like the smaller casting, or are you like you, you would do like a big production? You know, you'd get involved if you were to watch something like say like Aladdin or you know something like that in West End wise. Would you you know is that up your alley, or are you more uh, a central kind of performer? You know, how would you like it to be? Um, at the moment, my main experience lies in the smaller, smaller stuff yeah. because that's really where I am. Obviously, like you said before, I'm not really in one of the big cities. I don't have, I don't want to say I don't have as much opportunity because I do because I've done mm-hmm. what I feel to be a good amount for my age and for where I am. Um, the way I see it for my career, the idea is it just each year gets bigger and bigger and bigger until 
who knows where I'm going to be. You know, I, I'd love to be one of the in the one of the bigger budget productions um, yeah, yeah. because they're amazing to watch. It must be amazing at the end, you know. So mm. I think with uh, I think and all of our viewers, you know, like you say, I'll post on my page and promote your page throughout the you know you know in a couple of weeks or so. But if anything does happen, obviously next year, any big things, obviously the future, obviously come down and we can get like a release date and where we can watch it. Let us know. We will obviously let our viewers know that it's available to watch. We'll plug it. We'll make sure that you get out there. Uh, not because obviously I care what's in it, but what I really care about is getting tickets, obviously, to see you when you make it and obviously giving me half your profits. So, of course, you know, of course. Uh, well, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now your respective agent. This is how it works. Uh, Obviously, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, do you have like uh, an acting group? Do you find the same as you see now in big movies on the TV? I mean, if you watch anything with Tim Burton, you could probably name the five cast members he's going to cast in any, any movie he does. But do you now work in a close net? Do you always have the, the same co-stars? Do you, you know, do, have you created a circle, would you say, of when I go and do a performance, I know that such and such is probably going to be there with me? You know, has your little village, town, city, or wherever you are, you know, have you got a nice acting community going on? Um, it's a mixed bag there, I think. Um, for example, the, the short film I've done, um, it was with the same director and writer of U-Turn. So we got some of the U-Turn cast involved in this, so I kind of knew people I was going to see. Same as, obviously, my friends have common interests with me, so I've performed with them plenty of times. If I'm doing studio productions, I'm going to be with them. Same with Firefly, um, it's all of the usual suspects are often there. Um, but also the good thing about Firefly is there's so many different people. I've I don't think I've ever done a performance with them where I've known every single person in that in that okay. cast. Okay. And personally, I prefer to to work with a mix of people I know and people I don't know, people I can get to know. Um, I just like to make everyone feel included. Basically, that's that's my job on on stage on set is to make sure that everyone feels good, um, knows what they're doing, and just having a good time. Really. I think you're going to come under the category of a rare breed of unselfish performer. So uh, <laughs> credit to you, credit to you. Like you say, everybody's in it together. Um, so as I said before, we'll keep, make sure to keep plugging your stuff. We'll uh, we'll put some images up on our page as well of your performances uh, in the future and some that you've done already. Uh, we've been on air now almost two hours. and uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's crazy. So uh, thank you very much, Dave Still, who's been on the show. Uh, Harry, thank you very much for joining us today. I I hope that we have you on the show again if the show is still running and I haven't been, you know, swooped up by some news uh, reporting agency <laughs> that I'm now working for you know, uh, in the future. But if we're still going with Chatterley Live and obviously with all of our viewers, thank you very much for watching. We will make sure that Harry stays connected with us and uh, possibly have you back on the show again to fingers crossed promote the next big thing is that all right Harry? that would be great that would be great lovely right i'm gonna love you and leave you and i'm gonna finish our show before we uh before we go so harry thank you very much for joining we'll see you all soon thank you much cheerio bye bye Thank you very much for joining us today on Chatterday Live. As I've said, we have gone on for two hours today. I if you have stuck around for the whole two hours or had us around in the background, thank you. We do appreciate it. Once again main purpose of the show is that we are here to support mental health awareness and obviously our charity is well help for heroes you can help help for heroes by buying one of our chat live mugs um, get in contact directly with the show and purchase one of those you can have it just in time for christmas it's a way of giving to a charity but obviously getting something out in the return so we appreciate that uh, remember with mental health make sure you do stay in contact with your friends relatives maybe call people that you haven't been in contact with for a long while it's it's always nice just to check in because uh, especially with the current situation with uh, Corona 19, uh, COVID-19 and whatnot, it's nice just to know that you are connected and somebody cares about you. A uh, small little segment I have been asked. I did put the message out there and say anything that you'd like me to add to the show. We are now approximately coming up to 12 o'clock. So da -da 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 sports news on today. We do have Premier League football. We do have Brighton v Liverpool at half past 12 in the next 30 minutes. Uh, Man City v Burnley will be at three o'clock. 
Everton v Leeds at 5.30 and West Brom v Sheffield at 8 p.m. this evening. You've got the Scottish Leagues Championship. All games are going ahead. Uh, and I do believe there is rugby on today as well. I haven't done my full um, sports news, but there is sports on all day. Uh, my team, for those that know... Um, Newcastle United uh, gave uh, Crystal Palace a football lesson last night. So in the last 10 minutes and I was on the edge of my seat, but it happened. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Feel free. If you would like to be on the show or know anybody else that would like to promote their business themselves, their hobbies, or just generally wants to have a chit chat, we are welcome. That's what this show is all about. The reason why I did the sports as well is I do have some exciting news. I can't give you the full details, but I am currently in talks with an ex- professional football player who is going to be on the show and a football team and their manager is going to be on the show hopefully this time next week and it is big stuff i can't give away full detail and negotiations and uh, it's a lot bigger than where we've been so far so i'm very grateful for the opportunity so if you're lucky enough to stick around to the end of this you'll be one of the five or however many people are watching to know the big news there is going to be some actual massive big uh a show hopefully next week for you so stick around and uh, look at our facebook page ladies and gentlemen i've been jason robinson i've entertained you or bored you for the last two hours thank you very much enjoy your saturday and we'll see you all again next week. Bye.